Beyond humans, who builds the tallest structures? And how did Marcia reduce her chances <laughs> of dementia? <laughs> yes, you did something to reduce your chances of dementia recently. Drank a couple bottles of wine. We'll have that. <laughs> Answers to that and other questions coming up in this episode of The Off-Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith. Welcome to The Off-Ramp, a chance to slow down, steer clear of crazy, take a side road to sanity, and get some perspective on life. Well, Marcia, recently you did something to reduce your chances of dementia. <laughs> I didn't divorce you, so that's not good. <laughs> that would have been a contributing cause. <laughs> Is it anything with consumption of food or beverage? No, it, it's a type of surgery you had. Appendicitis. No, removal. no, no, it wasn't that one. Cataract surgery. Really? Believe it or not, Give yes. Me a break. It restores vision almost instantaneously to people whose vision has become cloudy, and it may have another benefit as well, reducing your risk for Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. Now, this is according to a new study <laughs> just published in JAMA Internal Medicine. This is a publication of the American Medical Association. Scientists have found that the overall risk for dementia was 29% lower in those who had cataract surgery. Now, why is that? Well, that's a good question. So they, they tracked... You asked yourself. <laughs> okay, so again, again you ask me, why is that, Bob? Okay. <laughs> why would removing cataracts reduce the risk of dementia? I don't know. The visual cortex undergoes changes with vision loss, and impaired vision may lessen input to the brain, leading to brain shrinkage. So when you open that up again, you're stimulating the brain. Clearing up your eyesight with cataract surgery may not only be a means of seeing better, it might help your brain become better stimulated and healthy. Ah. That study, again, published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Internal Medicine, reported in the New York Times, January 2022. Okay, Harold, thank so you. So that's how Marsha may have reduced her chances of dementia, by getting cataract surgery. Bob, that was very interesting. Okay, great. <laughs> Glad you think so. Okay, Bob. Uh -huh. Beyond humans. Yes. Who builds the tallest structures? Another good question, Marcia. From the book you gave me for Christmas. <laughs> oh, is this the uh, Guinness Book of World yeah. Records? Yeah. Okay, so aside from humans, what other creatures build the tallest structures? Uh -huh. For some reason, I'm thinking of ants because they build these things. But yeah. that's, is that it? No. Okay, what is it? Well, think again. Who else could build something tall? Monkeys. Monkeys, yay. No. Monkeys, no. Well, should I tell you how tall their cathedral-type abode is? Giraffes build buildings? <laughs> <laughs> okay, wh who is it? Termites. Oh, that's a trick question. No, it's not. Are they building anything? Don't they usually Australia to... has one termite cathedral type abode where they live that's, get it, 26 feet high. Now, is this something they yeah, actually yeah. built? Yeah, they built it and oh. they go in it. It's a high rise, Bob. It's, it, <laughs> it's a termite, termite high rise. Termite high rise made from soil, plant matter saliva and feces oh dear well you got to do what you got to do god okay here's a question true or false a cookbook's recipes can be copyrighted false what do you mean false false means no it can't be copyrighted you're right I, I thought this was interesting. So this is why they, when they do cookbooks, they do artwork and all this other stuff, you know, to make the thing look interesting because the information itself cannot be copyrighted. In 1996, in a lawsuit, Meredith Corporation accused Publications International of publishing recipes from its cookbook, discovered Dannon 50 famous recipes with yogurt. And even though Dannon's name was in there, a court said that recipes and instructions are not covered by copyright law. It makes sense to me. Really, when you think about it, even the very first American cookbook was borrowing recipes from England, the one uh, published in 1796, American Cookery. And so, you can't do that with uh, book titles either. No, not titles, but you can usually copyright content. But they yeah. basically say a recipe is merely a set of instructions, not an artistic creation. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's something fun. I'm going to give you some common abbreviations, and you tell me what it's shorthand for. Okay. Okay, starting with okay. Okay means, uh, what is okay? 
S box. I used to know that. Now Did I, you? I, yeah, just, I just lost it. Maybe I should have cataract surgery. <laughs> no, <I don't. laughs> okay, what does it stand for? It means all correct. O L L correct with a K O R R E C T. It was trendy shorthand at a Boston newspaper. And the invention of the telegraph made it standard. Hmm. It just I don't know if it was a joke. They just said, all correct. And on telegraph, you paid by word. So you had a sp- oh, short yeah. word and yeah. okay meant yeah. yes. Yeah. It's cheaper than yes when you had an okay. I'll bet you know this one, okay. RSVP. Respond, s'il vous plaît. Yes, very good. Please, if you please, yes. That's right. How about stat, S-T-A-T? Uh, that used to mean immediately, but it really doesn't mean that, does it? Well, originally, the Latin abbreviation was stratum, which means immediately. Okay. But in hospitals, it means situation is urgent. Yes. I I read a doctor saying, despite what you might see on television, we don't go around yelling stat all the time (laughs) in a hospital. You'd think so. Yeah, yeah, you would think so. Yeah, it's part of every medical show. Okay. DST? DST. DST? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is that destination? No. What is it? Daylight savings time. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> Thought I'd get you with a uh, easy one. And here's one that drives us all crazy. CAPTCH. C-A-P-T-C-H. That's that little test they give you to see if you're an automated robot. Yes. And uh, But it actually stands for something. C-A-P-T-C-H. Completely Automated Public Touring Test. It's a method of inquiry in artificial intelligence. So okay. it stands for Completely Automated Public Touring Test. All right. Capsh. I've got some words that used to mean something different than they mean now. Yeah, a lot of them. This used to be something negative. Oh, that amazes me, or I'm amazed by that. Uh huh. Well, it used to mean to stun or to fill a person with fear, panic, and alarm, to terrify. That was to in amaze the, them, huh? Yeah, to amaze somebody. Well, you know, when you read these old books, you see how they did use some words, and you go, "Really? We don't mean that today." Like um, terrific used to mean terrify. Yeah. But anyway, the 16th century amaze meant. To terrify and to alarm, to panic. Amuse. Amuse. The word amuse, what did that used to mean? Uh, uh, This was from the 1400s all the way up to the 18th century. I don't know. When you had amuse that you would... Amuse meant to delude, cheat, and deceive. We think of amuse meaning fun. Oh, it's fun. No, he amused her. He cheated her. Uh, He deceived her. her. Awesome. What did that used to mean? Uh, something terrible. Yes, fear or dread, all, A-W-E, substantial reverential fear, wonder, or respect, dates back to the 1570s. Yeah, but awesome. Actually, it's not been around that long as meaning how kids use it, how we all use it now. Right, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Okay, here's something you'll hate. My boy does not like riddles, and so I got one for you. <sighs> what three numbers in a row show the same result when multiplied or added together? What three numbers? In a row. So it's like four, five, and six, or one, two, and three, or... Something like that. I don't know, Marsh. What are they? You said it accidentally. What? One, two, three. How's that? One plus two plus three is six. Mm -hmm. One times two times three is what? Six. Okay. So it's... Isn't that... No, you don't think it's interesting. No, I don't. I do. (laughs) I never think those things are interesting. Don't you just like noodling that out? Mm. Multiplied or added together the same number. Thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. (laughs) Thank you very much. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. We had a little test on George Washington last week. Uh, Remember we determined he was the first president who sent the um, first email letter. It was a balloon. And he was the first president to go to all the states that were states at the time he was president. So what is the only place that George Washington ever visited outside of North America? Didn't he go to England or France? Nope, he never did. All the old guys went over there. No, no. Ben was there. Yeah, because they were diplomats for the United States. Yeah. They had to send somebody over there. Okay, did he go to Canada? Nope, didn't go to Canada. Did he go to Mexico? Nope, didn't go to Mexico. He went to Cuba. Close, The Bahamas. Close. (laughs) Philippines. Okay. In 1751, his half-brother, Lawrence Washington, came down with tuberculosis, and George, who was 19, accompanied him to spend a winter in sunny Barbados Okay. in hopes of recovering. And that was the farthest Washington ever traveled from his Virginia home and the only time he left mainland North America during his life. Huh. 
Did he like it, I wonder? Well, not really, because he contracted smallpox oh. there. <laughs> <laughs> it's always something, George. It's and always he, something. He spent much of the trip recuperating. Okay. But the, the home where the Washington brothers stayed on the island is still there. It's been saved as a museum yeah. in Barbados. I'll be darned. Okay. okay. Where and what is the largest solar-powered building in the world? It's not the Pentagon, is it? No. Is it out in the United States? Is it, it is. In the desert of the United States? No. No. Tell me. It's Apple's headquarters. Wow. In Cupertino, California. And it was opened in 2017 and is 2,798,600 square feet big. Well, that's big. That's very big. That's very big. Okay. Here's another thing that's been in the news lately uh, with the recent volcano severing the nation of Tonga's connectivity with the digital world. Remember that? Yes, I do. I thought it might be interesting to talk about all the undersea cables that not only connect islands, but the cables that connect the continents of the world. So, question, how many undersea cables are there on the ocean floors? Really? Okay, 463. Wow, you're close. Oh, 450. Really? <laughs> okay, here's the next one. Okay. <laughs> How many miles of undersea cables are there? Uh, 400 times. A million miles. More than a million miles in total. Very I got good. Both right. yes. yes. As the New York Times describes it, the cables are basically internet plumbing, and like all plumbing, it can suffer ruptures. Now, that cable was severed somewhere in the 500 mile run on the Pacific floor between Tonga and Fiji, and it only went live in 2013. That's all the longer they've had it. Uh, the interesting thing about that cable, it only serves 100,000 people. So it's very expensive when you're not going to serve more than 100,000 people. Yeah. Repairs can cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so that cable was financed by the World Bank Group and the Asian Development Bank because investors didn't want to touch something like that. Now, how do they connect those cables, the severed ends, when they do that? They would go underneath the ocean in a plastic bubble. <laughs> With hands, you know, like with okay. operatic, like, like with, when they operate like on people. Like hooks or something. You got it. You got it. You're good. You got three for three. I'll give you that. All right. The collective repairing the connection is going to use a special 150-yard long ship. It drags two grapnels, anchors with hooks, on the floor to find the severed ends of the cable. They may have been pushed several miles apart by the rupture of the of the oh, wow. volcano. Isn't that Jeez, amazing? Yeah. But when found, they are hoisted onto the ship. The torn ends are then trimmed and a replacement cable is spliced in and up to 50 people are involved in something like that. Now, the final question about undersea oh, cables. Oh, no. I, was I wanted to go out on... You did fine. You get three out of four so far, Marsh. <laughs> okay. Let's one try more. another one here. <laughs> I'm the carnival guy with it. Yeah. Here, just take, yeah, try the just ball try again. One more. See, one ball. more dollar. Oh, honey. I'm sorry you missed Aww. it. Yeah. How long have we had undersea cables? When were the first ones? Within about 10 years' time. Oh, for God's sakes. It was in the 19th century, meaning the 1800s. Oh, okay. And it was before Abraham Lincoln. Okay, well, then I will say 1812. Oh, I'm so sorry, Mom. <laughs> they, they had an overture that year. <laughs> <laughs> the first cable was laid in 1858, ah. and that connected telegraph lines between the U.S. and Europe, and Queen Victoria and President James Buchanan exchanged messages, and then the line went dead. <laughs> and it was eight years before the next successful cable was laid. So Abraham Lincoln and the Civil War happened in between. The way they did that was two ships met at mid-ocean, and then they took off in opposite directions, laying the cable. That's how those things happened. Okay, okay we're going to come back, and then you have to answer, who are Ormond and Sheringford? <laughs> okay, we'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Off-Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith. We're back. You're listening to The Off-Ramp with Bob and Marsha Smith, and Marsha had a very cryptic-sounding question there. Yes. Yes, this is uh, not the names we know them by today. Okay. But originally, these two guys were Ormond, Ormond Sacker to be precise, and Sheringford. Who are they? Ormond Sackford and Sheringford. <laughs> Don't you love it? Is this a law firm? Uh, <laughs> a comedy team? No. Uh, composers? No. Two inventors? No. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. No. Okay. I, I gave you four or five categories there, and none of those are right. No, you'll love the Are answer. they scientists? No. Okay. Who are they? Okay. It's Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Oh, that was their original names? Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, in his first short story of the two sleuths, had different names for them. Ormond Sacker was Watson, <laughs> and Sherlock was Sheringford Holmes. 
But before he came out the next year, 1887, with a study in Scarlet, he changed their names to Sherlock and Dr. Watson. That's what? much better yeah, than Ormond and what's that again? <laughs> Sheringford. <laughs> Ormond and Sheringford. <laughs> Doesn't roll off Oh, the my top. goodness. Isn't that funny? All right, Marcia, we did the who has the most sun, who has the most snow, who has the strongest winds. This is a global question. Okay. Who has the least amount of sunshine? What's the city? In the in the continent. In the far? world. In the world. Yes. And here I'll give you the ones to choose from, okay? Yeah, oh, good. Fairbanks, Alaska, mm-hmm. Bergen, Norway, mm-hmm. or Torshavin, Denmark. It's like Armand. Armand was living in Torshavin, Denmark. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Well, golly. I'll say Alaska. No, it's Torshavin, Denmark, it Marcia. Okay. That's I thought the fact that I had a hard time pronouncing so, yeah, it would tell I, you. Oh, yeah, that's the right, one. Right. So if you're working on your tan, you probably want to avoid Torshavin, the yeah, capital of the Faroe Islands, part of Denmark. Flanked by two mountains, the coastal city receives an average of just 2.4 hours of sunshine a day. Oh, wow. 840 hours a year. Wow. That's it, of the sunshine. I'm canceling that cruise, baby. On the bright side, the cloudy weather and ice-free water means the winters are relatively mild. The temperatures rarely dip below freezing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, do you know, uh, speaking of the biggest and the strongest, this and that, we're talking about winds? Mm Mm-hmm. Let's talk solar system. What planet in the solar system has the strongest winds, up to 1,500 miles per hour to be exact. Wow. Is that Saturn? Nope. Is it Jupiter? Nope. Is it Tucson, Arizona? (laughs) (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Where where is it? Neptune. Oh. It's the farthest solar planet from the sun and the fourth largest. It's 17 times, though, the mass of Earth. So it's a lot bigger than us, but it's only the fourth largest. And you said that that is considered now the last planet in our solar system because Pluto is not considered a planet anymore. Remember, that was one that we always had to memorize that. that, You know, remember, da-da-da-da, and Pluto. No, not no more. I never had to memorize that. Oh. I think they just let me go to study hall during science class. (laughs) Well, speaking of science, sunshine. What city in the world has the most sunshine? And guess what? It's in the United States. Is it Tucson? No, but it's close. It's the other one where people go in Arizona. They only go to two places in Arizona? Well, where do people go to retire? (laughs) Tucson and what's that? Phoenix? Yeah. No, it's not Phoenix. Is it in California? No, I said it's in Arizona. I know that. Flagstaff? No. Sedona? No. Tell me. It's in Yuma. Ah. Yuma, Arizona. Uh, yeah, that's the world's sunniest city. They receive 4,015 hours of sunshine on average each year. Wow, that's, that's according to the World Atlas. Wow. I bet you the people from What's It would like to go visit there every summer. From What's It would like to visit, where should we call it? Yeah. Where to go? Yeah. You must be saying that the people from Torshavin, Denmark, would yeah. like to visit Yuma. Yeah, I could only say Denmark. I could say the other one. Okay. Okay. Bob, who has the loudest animal-made sound amplifier built in to their body there? I would say it's an elephant because they get that trumpet and everything. Yeah. With their, yeah. That's it. But no. Oh. A little smaller. Would it be a lion? No. Smaller. A cricket. That's it. What? Good for you, Jiminy Cricket. Explain that. Specifically, the European mole cricket who digs burrows with their two horn-shaped openings. uh, I was just kidding. I know. And they act like stereo speakers. When he rubs his little forewings together, when he's trying to attract a mate, you know, they rub their wings together. The resulting sound is 115 decibels and is equivalent to the sound of a lawnmower. Wow. (laughs) A cricket with the sound of a lawnmower. Yeah. I'd like to hear that. Or maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't like to hear that. It's amplified in their little stereo speaker head. uh, Wow. When when you're looking for a a mate. You're going to make yourself heard. I guess so. That guy's got a great noggin. <laughs> Is that what the girls say? <laughs> Jeez. All right. I've got more words here that used to mean something different, okay? Okay. What did the word boy originally mean? B-O-Y? Yeah, this goes back as far as the 1200s. Well, geez. That's right before I was born. Yeah, I know. It's a little earlier than... 
1200s. Boy, okay, tell me. It used to mean a male servant, a slave, an oh, assistant, yeah. or a junior employee. That's how it got that meaning is a mystery, but that was originally what boy meant. That's why people say boy meaning yeah. a servant. So what were men called? I, well, Just they weren't men. they weren't called boys. No. Okay, ah. now about the uh, word careful. Careful, what did that mean in the 1200s? Careful. Think about it in terms of yeah. care, and full. full. Yeah. Full, a person who was full of care. A person who was full of grief, mourning, or sorrow. Oh. Okay. Cared so much. Oh. That's what careful used to mean. Yeah, well, that makes sense. And dizzy, what did that used to mean? But it means in slang right now. She's dizzy or he's dizzy. Dizzy means foolish or stupid. Yeah. That was the original meaning of the word dizzy. Not, oh. not that I have some kind of a vertigo or something like that. Like a dizzy broad. That's right. All right, one more. Okay. Fond. F-O-N-D. F-O-N-D. In the 1300s, that used to mean? Fond. Foolish or silly. And then finally, the word fun. What was the word fun? F-U-N. What, what did it originally mean? When I tell you, go, oh, I can see why that got that meaning. Really? Yeah. Oh. We think of fun being, oh, they're fun, or it was a fun thing to do, right? Yeah. It originally meant to trick or deceive. So like, oh, they were having fun with him. You know? Oh, wow. That's where it came from. No it was kidding. like not a nice thing. They were being mean to that yeah. person by having fun, oh. tricking or deceiving. And oh. that's what fun meant in the 1680s. Now it means something more positive. All right. Okay. Before I go to my final quote of the show, what do the letters in Shazam stand for? The letters in Shazam? Yeah. Do you mean it's an acronym? Yeah. I didn't know that. I didn't either. Shazam. And who said Shazam? Now, and don't tell me if I'm that goofy Gomer TV Pyle? Pre- oh, I Gomer knew Pyle. you were going to say no, that. No, no, no. Um, he did Shazam, say- though, didn't that come from a... Um, the, I thought it was something like the flying carpets and all of that, you know, one of those Middle uh-huh. Eastern kind of uh-huh. stories. Uh-huh. Is that where it came from? Well, no. Okay, what is it? Marvel Comics. Oh, they came up with it? The word was shouted to conjure up comic book hero Captain Marvel when they wanted to, to see Captain Marvel. Shazam! Well, what did that mean? It stood for Solomon's Wisdom, Hercules' Strength, Atlas's Stamina, Zeus's power, Achilles' courage, and Mercury's speed. Well, I had no idea. Shazam. Uh, (laughs) Shazam. Yeah. So Gomer was reading those comic books is what you're telling me. I think that's what was going on there. You watched that. What was that program? Gomer Pyle, USMC. No, I never watched it. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, yes, I did, of course. Oh, Lord. Shazam. Well, who didn't watch it? Oh, I I didn't, Bob. Oh. What was his, was he a, what was he, sheriff or something? Or what was his Oh, he was a deputy from, uh, you know, from uh, the town where Andy Griffith was, and then he went in the military. That was, you know, it was kind of Vietnam, comedy in Vietnam, only he he never made it there, you know. There was so much back then. All right. All right. Before we go, I have an interesting question, and I I found this out just the other day on the web, and I thought it was fascinating. What country, all right, has its own national type font? <laughs> really? Yeah, can you imagine that? No. We're all familiar with type fonts. They all look different. All There's of us, every Roman. Well, people who use computer, they have a I, chance to try different ones. So which country has its own national type font? Is it a Middle East country by any chance? No, it's not. That's a good guess because some yeah. of those are very unique looking yeah. script. They yeah. have to convert. Uh huh. I don't know. It's Sweden, which is not surprising because Sweden's famous for Scandinavian design and IKEA. <laughs> but Sweden was the first country to introduce its own signature typeface, a new font to be used on all government signs, documents, and properties. The result was Swedish Sans, a modern, minimalist, geometric typeface with no legs, you know, yeah. Sans without. Yes, dear. Uh, inspired by retro Swedish signs from the 1950s. The uh, font is intended to project a cohesive visual identity of Sweden to the world. Well, that's that's very smart. And the the typeface is called Swedish Sans? Swedish Sans. Okay. Sans. Sans. Yeah, sans, meaning sans, sans. Yeah. So it's without the uh, legs and so forth. Okay. Two questions about state capitals, all right? Nicknames of state capitals or names of state capitals. What state capital used to be called Pig's Eye Landing? Isn't that charming? Pig's Eye Landing. Really brings in the tourists. <laughs> <laughs> this sounds like, that sounds like it would be a southern state or yeah, a western but it's state. Not, it's is not. It? It's a, from a northern state. Northern place that has pigs. Pig's Eye Landing. You've been there They're numerous farms. times. I have. Yeah. All right. I'll say uh, 
Minneapolis. St. Paul, Minnesota. Okay. So it's the Twin enough. City I'll to Minneapolis. Darn. Yeah. It was uh, known as Pig's Eye Landing in 1838, the first settlement there. It was named after a tavern owner named Pierre Pig's Eye. The name only lasted until 1841. That's when a Roman Catholic missionary built a chapel dedicated to the Apostle Paul. <laughs> said, let's change this to St. Paul. <laughs> Isn't that, isn't that yeah. funny? We're going to Pig's Eye today, honey. And one more. Which state capital is known as the city in a forest? Uh, You've been there, too, and I didn't know that this was what it uh, is known as. Is it in a, is it in a forest yes. today? Yes. Well, I mean, it's, is it surrounded surrounded by, by it's surrounded by woods. Not as much as you would think, but, yeah, but originally it was. Day. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Half the city is covered by tree canopy, so it's got a lot of trees. So it's nothing like... Uh, it's a big city. Is uh, it in the Midwest? Nope, it's in the South. Oh, I'll bet you it's... Uh, Almost uh, everybody has to go through it at some Savannah? point or another. No, but nearby, same state. Yeah, uh, Atlanta. Atlanta, that's right. It's nicknamed the city in a forest because nearly half the city is covered by tree canopy. Substantially higher than other large U.S. cities. So pines, oaks, magnolias, and dogwoods, some dating back more than 200 years, dominate Atlanta's urban settings. So they provide a lot of shade and filtering out pollutants. So there you go. City in a forest is Atlanta, and Pig's Eye Landing is (laughs) St. Paul. All right. (laughs) Pretty good. Yes. Okay, I'm going to finish up with a quote from my buddy, Dalai Lama. Don't let the behavior of others destroy your inner peace. That's what you have to do in life, isn't it? You have to kind of keep your own zen. Every day. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's what you think of me. I'm always trying to destroy (laughs) your inner peace. That's where this is coming from. It doesn't work. (laughs) All right, Marcia. Well, that's all we have for today. We hope you'll join us next time as we bring you more trivia. I'm Bob Smith. I'm Marcia Smith. Join us again next time when we return with more fun facts on The The Off-Ramp. The Off-Ramp is produced in association with CPL Radio Online and the Cedarbrook Public Library, Cedarbrook, Wisconsin.